Good day and like to introduce you uh, uh, Roberto Rojas Esa of the Department of Teaching and Engineering, New Jersey Institute of Technology. He was uh, in <laughs> and I'd like to the word to the speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody. Good morning. <coughs> also, I'm so pleased to be here to give a presentation on, on this conference and also to be back into this kind of alma mater for me. I got uh, my master's degree on electrical engineering from the Department of Bioelectronics. Uh, 21 years ago, so well, uh, it has been some time already, but that happens to them. And then after that, I went to do my PhD in the U.S. I went to Polytechnic University, where it's now New York University. But things happen, and then you start getting into different opportunities for doing research on different areas. And we do that, and then you start working on different topics. But uh, today, I want to share with you some experiences that we have. And do we need to use the microphone? Oh, can you hear me without it? So, uh, some experience that we have doing with uh, free space optics. What we're trying to do is to communicate using laser light, which is very popular, has been around for many years, and with a special application to high speed trains. Now, high speed trains maybe is something that looks like a fabric, especially for everybody. Not many countries have it. But it's something that is coming slowly into the future as a means of transportation, especially when we're talking about cost and when we're talking about uh, something that is sensitive to nature. So I'm uh, going to tell you about some uh, research that we have been doing in this area. And in addition, we have also some exciting research that we have fun at the end to talk about something about we want to plan to do. Yes, you can use the microphone. Here with the microphone. I would prefer not to have it. This is why, right? Hello? Okay. And the other one is going to be about power grid. So power grid is something that you know we work with it every day. We really very very much. But we've seen that for more than 100 years has been always the same thing. And of course, there is no complaints because most of the days work. The only problem comes when we have a blackout. So I want to talk to you about what we think about what we can do about it. We can apply it to high speed trains because high speed trains are mostly electrical. But we know that there are some trains that are diesel, but they have a different kind of fuel to make them work. But that's going to be a common denominator for high speed trains. So, free space optics, what is that? Then it's practically using light to communicate. And if we look backward into history, maybe one of the more ancient means of communications. If you can think about the making hand signals for somebody to understand, which is something that we come back to where nobody speaks the language, right? We don't speak the language there. The only thing you can do is to use sign language. So that's actually being possible by using one of our receivers on that kind of in the eyes by somebody making signs. <coughs> so it's there all the time. We use it every day, not only in electronics, not only for data communications, but in every daily life experience. What you can see is that during the branch of history, we can find many uh, places where light has been a way to communicate. We see something, for instance, uh, here are some traces of archaeology where we see some uses of mirrors. So mirrors are going to be some deflectors of light to be able to get that communication into our eyes, which our eyes are going to be the receiver, which has a bandwidth of one minute per second according to some neurologists. Then we see that some of the people have used mirrors also to communicate with particular light signals at long distances. We will use a source, light source as the sun, right? And currently, 
the last means of communication between boats before the engagements into sun aggression, we see that it's contrary by using various signals. Now, in the past, you can see that actually that Graham Bell in the 1800s developed the first telephone using light communication. It probably was something very early at that stage. What on this thing, what is exactly is free space optics? As I said before, it practically using light. And what we see as a means of, of source of light are going to be lasers. And the other ones are going to be LEDs, which is the latest uh, trend on FSO. And also you can use you know, any different type of lights, including fluorescence light. Transmit information by using those lamps, even though at a very low rate, but you can do it. So it's a very exciting area of communications because light is something that really attracts us very much. As you can see, everything that, that is going to call your attention for anything in commerce, study, is going to be like, it's going to be something that you can see. What is the advantage on using free space optical communications? That we're going to have a very high bandwidth. So because light it actually is a signal at very high speeds, therefore, we're going to have the availability of having the transmission of very high data rates. So we have practically two types that are the trends now for using uh, free space optics. One is going to be optical wireless or what we're going to call in general free space optics. You know, free space optics includes communication with laser lamps or LEDs. Okay, so it's everything that you can use light. I call in free space optics again, free space optics to using only lasers. Now, when we're using LEDs, people start wondering, well, what kind of color should I use for communication with LEDs? Well, now with the trend of so securing all the light bulbs that we have from incandescence to LEDs, we start talking about visible light. So these lights that you see on the ceiling are going to be substituted by LEDs. If they are not LEDs, they are already LEDs. So the only thing that we're missing them, see now, so you can use that one to communicate with your computers. Instead of using Wi-Fi, for example. Okay. So we have two types. One is optical wireless, or FSO. And the other one is going to be visible light communications, or what people also call light. Now here is a picture of the spectrum uh, where we can see we're actually located. So we are actually in this region, in the terahertz bandwidth, right? So that's, that means that the frequencies are very high. And usually, the bandwidth that we're going to have in every one of the bands that we use for communication. So that means that the data rate that you can achieve is going to be beyond the average per second if we do everything correctly. And the visible light part, using LEDs, is going to be this visible light of spectrum while FSO may be used infrared. And hopefully, you're going to have some UV, but UV is a little bit dangerous to work with because it's pretty bad for our eyes. That's why we have that kind of sun protection on the earth, and we don't get the UVs from the sun, or at least not as much. So what is uh, visible light communications? As I said before, it is. But we're going to have some photo detectors, and that that's going to be our interface to connect to the computers or any other physical device. The internet means that we're going to have some driver that is going to be the modulator for signals of data into the LEDs and so on. And this is very attractive. People are very much into it. If you see what is happening in the research market right now, there are going to be a lot of people working. Why? Because it seems to be very promising. Everything that is like uh, edge communications is going to be calling a lot of attention. Why? Because the market can be really large. So, um, <clears throat> what is the problem with this visible light communications? Well, if you see this picture, lamps are going to be transmitting data. So that's what we see on the streams in blue color. But actually, we see something else here, something like waves here. So that means that. Usually, this is one-way communications because we're using these lights to communicate down to us. But how do we communicate back? Remember that we're talking the internet, and that's going to be the major source of uh, interest for most of us to have data communication. That's the way we get email. That's the way we get text messages and so many other different things. We need to have a way back, right? If you're going to send requests, 
And then you're going to get data. You have some responses and knowledge in where you get that data or not, at least. And so on. So we need to send some data from the computers or appliances back into the internet. But we don't have light on our laptops. Otherwise, we have to be illuminating the ceiling or some other place. So we need to use another technology to do that. People have been happy to use this has been Wi-Fi. So in certain way, still, even though it's very promising, it still has some questions to be answered whether it's going to be working for the future because it seems to be only one way. Now there are some other more problems with life. Like for instance, to be able to have actually this visible light, which actually called white light, we need to have a lot of blue light. So the visible light is going to be a combination of primary colors. In what we have the blue light, and that blue light is also very close to UV. And this is something that we don't want to have around very much. Right? So, why? Because it's damaging. In free space optics, uh, but we're going to have then it's a laser. About laser, I mean, talking about blue light, which is going to be bad for you, laser is going to be worse. Well, probably. But the good thing is that laser is going to be very coherent. Be spreading out too much around the same trajectory because it's a quality thing. Here it's going to be a laser signal of you know, polymerine lenses that is going to be the rotation of the uh, light environment. And then we're going to have some receivers. Here we have a photodiode. And once you get the signal, you to be able to get all the. And um, something that is going to be very attractive for this is that it's licensed, especially for those cell phones providers. They have to be those little pieces of bandwidth that we have in the spectrum. Right? Here we don't have to do that. The frequency is very high. Now, the, because of the frequency is very high, that's going to be one gigabit per second, you can get even more than that. And then you can communicate a very long Range. We're talking about tens, even hundred thousand of kilometers. I want to show you an example where we can actually do that. This one seems to be easy and quick deployability. Probably quick, easy, that depends on you make the system work first. So this is only for one-way communications and different from live five. Here we're gonna have a counterpart that is going to be similar to this, but in the opposite direction. So when you use FSO. In comparison to Life 5, we have a duplex system. Now, here we have an example of a duplex system. So, if you use now different wavelengths, you can even use the same regions. You don't have to really do a parallelism on the space. We can have the transmission almost from the same points on the transceivers. Gonna give us a, a big advantage from doing that. Now, how is actually looking for the future to invest some time on doing FSO? Well, FSO has been around 1800s. We saw that the photophone was invented by Bell. That's gonna be too long, it was 100 meters or so. And then we have the laser diode, because the, the laser beam was invented in the and then somebody come up with the idea of doing that. So we have in, in the 1860s FSO systems, we were expecting to have a lot of deployments in them, a lot of maturation, meaning that we're going to have a lot of different things that we can use. But then the fiber optic came out. So you don't have to be struggling to pass the beam to the air. You just have to put it into the fiber cable. And that's going to be even traveling longer. Why? Right? Because it has fewer obstacles to, to deal with. And we see this one that if we separate the market into VLC, which is visible light communication, FSO, FSO was expected to have about 112 million in 2017 and 1.2 billion in 2022. It's a sizable amount of growth. But if we see DLC, that's going to be 1.3 billion in 2022. That is pretty even large. So life art is very promising. And come back to the FSO. Why is a huge market because everybody uses it? Even though you have LTE, 
we cannot still live without life, with our Wi-Fi. <clears throat> so moving on, FSO is being popular right now, communications, and that's the way that is mostly done estimation before. Why? Because we don't have to move. People have thought that if I have a laser beam, the laser beam is so small, you will have focus. These people created a company, for instance, Mike Ponte is one of the leaders in this, uh, this area, in this market. It's where you have offices regarding in different places, and you have virtual private networks, and you need to communicate, but you don't need to pay for deployment of higher cable. Here's on top of the buildings, and these guys will communicate as if they were very close by. The bandwidth is very high. You can go to one year per second or even higher, which probably is more than you need. But there is some problems too. If we have a skyscraper, we have some building motion, which is actually happening, not necessarily it's going to move anyway. We have fog. We have some scintillation created by just the air. Some reflections from windows and even the transceiver itself is going to reflect some beam back to the to the source. So there are some problems to do with this. The sunlight is another source. Now what we want to do then is to do something that communicate with mobile systems. So people are looking into different applications of using FSO using UAVs. So in UAVs, these devices fly at very long distances, and sometimes doing radio frequency for communicating is too costly. We don't want to do that because you need a lot of power and you probably want to be wasting. But instead of that, if we use a beam, the more polymeric we have a beam, the longer distance we can travel and communicate at higher, higher rates. This is going to be one of the applications. I want to talk a little bit more about the, the system, the mm -hmm. it's possible to communicate at very long distance. And we have that are also calling a lot of attention. Friends on the loom project from Google, by looms, to be able to provide LTE signal into different wide regions, which is going to a little bit of struggles this time because of the hurricanes. They don't have LTE network right now. It's getting these balloons flying on top of Puerto Rico, and the communication between these balloons is contributed by SSO. And the signal that coming from some base stations to the balloons is going to be LTE in one of the points, like an access point. And then after that, we're going to have a high data rate communicating between the balloons. So these balloons have to be controlled by the different rays on the stratosphere that is going to have different currents, and that's the way they drive it. So it looks a little bit difficult to handle moving all the time. <clears throat> Facebook came up with its own project, and instead of using balloons, it's practically the same idea, but it's going to be using UAPs. But these UAPs are going to be flying very high, at very low speeds, so they have a very large wingspan, and they also be solar power to be able to do the same thing. They want to use also FSO to communicate between every one of the UAVs to be able to provide the LTC. I believe they are providing LTE signal to the final users. Why they don't use FSO? Well, because we don't have FSO interfaces, right? For instance, right now in Puerto Rico, nobody has FSO interfaces on the cell phones, and I can bet you that we don't have it yet. Even though we can that we have on the cell phones to help and do this. Now, some of the more impressive experiments on FSO that to put everything on the ground would be this experiment that NASA did a long time ago. And um, what NASA did is uh, sent to a satellite to circulate the moon, and it has an FSO terminal on it. And then from that distance, they will communicate up to 622 megabits per second to Earth. And that's a very high. So what they did is to put a very powerful laser, about 40 watts, very polymeric, but that polymeric and that very long distance, that is going to be, a, you know, uh, many kilometers, 400,000, you know, 400 kilometers to the air, is going to be spun into a spot that is going to be of the size of Texas. It's remarkable, right? 
And if we see, we see this kind of experiment, we will wonder, well, if they can transmit at this very high speed rate, at this time, right, they are very long distance. It seems like the problems are actually solved. But the thing is that laser traveling on empty space is pretty good at it. Why? Because there is no clouds that are going to be obstructing it. So the only losses that we're going to have there, it's going to be the geometrical losses of the thing. Travel that's going to be spreading, and that's going to create some losses. OK, we actually do free space optics. Well, we have to have light sources. We have to have sensitive receivers. Got there for, especially for solid state people. Some modulation and coding, right? But something very important for us is going to be this acquisition tracking and monitoring. Why? Because as we said, every time these receivers are going to be moving, that is light outside control. Meaning you always have to have transmitter pointing to each other. Pointing to each other all the time. And we have some modeling according to the system that we want to implement. Just to go quickly on this. <laughs> Many different challenges. And the first challenge that comes to mind because we're talking about lasers, because we are used to consider a laser a very polymeric beam, uh, beam sorry, uh, is that if we move some of the receivers or some of the transmitters, we're going to be misaligning the beam. Because we're going to be losing power at the receiver side. And that means that you're going to have a high signal, uh, sorry, low signal to noise ratio, error rate. In other words, your data rate is going to be low. You don't want to do that. Some other things that we also have to consider if we communicate with SFSO on Earth, either problems, right? Not, not much for the rain, but it's going to be a lot for the fog on case. Also, some vibration of these uh, systems, especially when we want to make it on a moving part. Turbulence is something is actually happening with a lot of wind. It's going to create a lot of power losses. We want to apply this episode into fast speed trends, as I said before. So, so, so this is going to be a challenge to have a mobile uh, station that is not going to be in place. And we are concerned about having this line of sight all the time. It's actually going on high speed trends. Well, it's a tricky question to travel on a high speed train to try to give you guarantees that you're going to be able to travel, no guarantees that you're going to be able to communicate. The part is actually lead to a third party, like just say a system or a data provider like some, or some local companies here like Proletel Cell. So, some of the different makers of high speed trains and users, what they do is just provide you some wide found station. That's what's happening in Japan. And if you want to communicate from the train, sometimes you have to use your LTE from your cell phone. Why? Because you have a lot of people on the train and the LTE part is actually also limited in time, especially when we're talking about one single cell. The part is to use, you know, uh, Different technologies like a Wi Fi train and some antennas to be able to augment issues like Highway. Highway is a, a company in communication that's very interesting in it because China now is a very uh, potential manufacturer of high speed trains. News that China was bringing some high speed trains to Mexico, right? So famous, but rather than famous history. But probably it's going to happen. Sooner or later, they are importing a lot of fast speed trains. And one of those companies are the ones who are actually asking us to work on this technology. We're working in some companies with China's uh, manufacturers of high speed trains. And that's why we're working on this project. Very quickly, just to give an idea about the high speed trains. So we have a list of the registered fastest high speed train to work. Uh, currently, it's something in Shanghai, right? Of course, practically we have Japanese trains, Chinese trains. We actually translate translated into German. We have the United States, which is actually, but you see the speed when you come to the United States. 
question is why because interested and because of the same reasons we started to do research on this area is that FSO for high speed trends is on this. Meaning there is not much work done. So we have ample of opportunity to do something. And then we have some very basic questions to be able to jump into this. Now something just to make clear, why we want to use communications in high speed trends, two different things. One, we want to manage the movement of the trend. The second thing, and probably more demanding, is because we want to provide data when you are traveling a trend on some place where you actually work on their phone, right? And you start watching some movies or doing whatever else you want to do. Now, quickly, why are we not using radio frequency technologies? Well, different types of technologies. One is the one that's going to be for short range, that is going to be for uh, wide maps, right? Uh, wi Fi. But you know, they just want to have a very small bandwidth. It's going to talk about less than 100 megabits per second. So for many people into one part of the train, that's going to be a lot of aggregated bandwidth that you need to run into. So we can actually use the per second. So this is going to give you a very high data rate. It's very ideal for doing this. It seems to be a very uh, strong contender rate because it's already deployed. And it seems to have a very high bandwidth. It's going to be shared by many of the users. For instance, a base station may be about 500 megabits per second in rough data rate, and that has been shared by many users that are connected at that time. So that's why it's going to be uh, motivating to use FSO for high speed train communications. To FSO, the different applications you can have, you can use a very uh, uh, intergalactic communications. You cannot just use between buildings, right? And if we look into the application for light communication, we see that it's actually for every different instance. So it has a big potential to be adopted in different applications, right? Now, <clears throat> let's start attacking some of the problems that are going to be uh, critical for implementing FSO using an acquisition tracking and pointing mechanism. Do is to keep the line of sight. But before you keep the line of sight, you need to acquire the line of sight. Meaning, if you don't know where the receiver is, you need to find it. Interesting, especially for military applications where you need to have an automatic weapon that is going to find the target uh, by itself. And that's why many people are also interested in ATPs. So, first, you're going to have to point the transceivers. Second, you have to acquire the, the light signal. And finally, you have to keep that pointing by using tracking. ATP mechanisms. Now, these different mechanisms designed for different applications. Whether you want to do a very rough pointing, meaning that you have to move to be able to find your transceivers, or because you actually want to do just minimum adjustments, let's say so minor adjustments of your transceivers. Um, classification of the different ATP mechanisms, just to do very quickly. So we use gimbals to be able to do major adjustments of angle, do some medium adjustment of angles, and some adaptive optics to uh, adjust on very uh, small distances. And among them, we have uh, degree crystals and some other more. Hybrid approaches where we use the FSO and combine it with radio frequency to be able to point the devices to each other and so on. So quickly passing into that, this is what a gimbal is actually doing. It's going to be a, a system that is going to be on in different angles and to be able to find the signal. Now this is used for mostly having a displacement of many degrees. But most people who are actually using FSO for high speed trains are actually basing these high speed mirrors can move fast and very small amounts, very small steps. So they can give you very nice adjustments onto the beams. Right? You need that one to be able to have a stable system when you are aligning the beams. 
And then we have adapted optics that is going to be very small signals, probably microelectromechanical signals, that are going to have a small, mirror, a small mirrors. And you're going to be able to control these small pieces of mirrors to be able to do several things, usually are using for avoid from way to be able to deflect the beans very small amounts. Three types of adaptive topics here. So one is when you have an adapter so at the receiver side. So something you have a transmitter, something happened because so there's some different temperatures on the environment. Waves start changing the speed in what they and they come a little bit distorted. So we have some elements on the adaptive office that are going to detect what are the distortions that we have on the front wave, modify that information to be able to receive the wave correctly to the receiver. But then we have a local feedback mechanism that is going to try to give you information about how to adjust it. Uh, this seems to be fine, but the only problem is that you're going to be able to correct it. You have to correct it very quickly just at the end. So some of the signal is going to be lost because you need to detect it that it's actually wrong. Uh, uh, on adaptive optics on the transmitter side, so the transmitter is going to try to where it's going to have a duration of adjustment before the signal is actually transmitted. To be able to know what is actually happening, we need to have a signal mechanism that is perfect. This is a very long distance lose that it's going to be a certain delay and then you will may not be able to do this adjustment some time. The thing is to kind of combine these two mechanisms. The same thing, just having some part of the receiver side, some part of the transmitter side. And we're gonna have two different feedback loops with different feedback uh response time. We probably something more complex. Then coming back into the UAB if we have to do something like that, to do a way of first, have a very complex system that you are heavy, right? And you don't want something that consumes a lot of power because the UAP may have limited power amount to be able to travel, to do some of the jobs, okay? So for that one, we're gonna have some reflectors. What is it? The source signal. This signal may not have any information on it, but you just provide it as a source. And then it's back. So when it comes back, it comes as, and that includes the data that you want to transmit for the UAB to communicate from the UAB to the ground. You may have to use some signal separate this one. It what to do. Liquid crystal. So the liquid crystal have some small signals. Electrical signals are going to different particles of the liquid crystals. They are type of adaptive topics where you want to modify the liquid crystals to be able to reflect the amounts and then the right direction and so on. This ATP mechanism is a very small area of coverage because you need to be able to do it right. If you can find them, then it's going to be a very hard thing to use over there. And you know, you have a spherical area where you can actually be pointing to that system. So thinking about doing so, so you can point it to every one of the directions and speed up the alignment of the transceivers. So the system that we're going to be using mostly in high speed trends is going to be a five three meter base. The advantage that we have in high speed trains and actually in trains is that we know what the trains want to pass on. And using on cars or any other car because we know exactly the train to follow. So that's going to give us a lot of advantage. That's going to simplify the high speed mechanics. Okay. Five speed mirrors, light beams, and fine because they are calling them their thing, right? Type of light that is highly dispersed, and that's going to be an LED. That's that is going to be very large. Louis or so, even larger than that. You find. 
So we have uh, some beacon light, which is going to be made by LEDs. We have some laser light. They're going to be both using. And you find the beacon light, and we are going to assume that you almost find the gamma star. We're going to change that to be highly colored. That's what we're going to learn. I see an angle sensor to be able to find the beacon light. Beacon light. They're going to try to do a finer adjustment by having a telescopic lenses to be able to find the beam. Right Now, since we have the receiver, and remember, we're going to have a full nuclear system. We're going to have also a receiver and vice versa. Right? Align one of these pairs, the other pair is automatically aligned itself. So that's going to be the advantage. All right, so this is the background for high speed. To do is we want to do it is for this kind of high speed trains because they want to provide a kind of service and make it attractive. Now the first question is uh, should we use? Should we use a small bean that is highly collimated or some bean that we can disperse? That we have first. We then ask us, okay, well, then we need to research. So we have two different types of beans just to make it. A short story. That was going to be a weekly, what is something that is going to be a widening. So, how many different types of divergence angles you have for diving? The divergence angle is how much the light is going to be spreading, right? That's going to be any amount. Now, we have to, con uh, to be concerned about picking what is the right thing that we want to use because in the literature we found that. Some FSO communication system for high speed trains use a narrow beam. Use a wide one should we choose? So, if we have a narrow beam, you can communicate very long distances. It's a nice experiment. You know, a very high data rate, right? That kind of communication for people, if they ever go to Mars, that's the way they want to. They want so, second, if I want to use a wide beam, of course I won't be able to reach very long distances. But I don't need to trace that beam too much. I don't need to do the alignment so perfect, so I can relax my constraints for my ATP and I can too much, right? So what I need to do then is to be which one of these two is more. So I have to look into the contact time, meaning so I'm uh, wide object that is moving at 400 kilometers per hour with like high-speed trains is going to be in contact with a transceiver because we know that we have a limited range, especially if we use a wide beam. I have a five-speed mirror, but that five-speed mirror, number one, kind of steer angle, and number two, kind of steer too fast. There has to be a limit on it, right? There's a practical limit. This is one thing when we do something in theory, another thing is when you actually build it. And then we have some possible things that are happening on the train, like for instance, transceiver vibration. So that vibration always occurs. That's why we get mostly tired every time we travel, even though we're just sitting there. And we have to take into consideration being we have to be susceptible to losing the signal. Now, if we look at that, the beams are going to come into play now. So it's sadly how the beam of a laser illuminates. About collimated beam and beams, and then we see that it's going to be very uniform, very pointy. On the case, you will look today carefully. You see that the power of the beam is something mostly located in the middle. And then it's going to be start fading on the side. The same for both axes, X and Y. So we have to keep that in mind. Now, this is a very the beam. 
the anything that you see on the lenses, everything is going to be very sensitive. Uh, the formations or it's condensed and then so just to give an image uh, about what we design to is compare these two systems. Why? What is an arrow beam to be less than 0 0.1 millimeter? Less than half micro degree uh, of the hypertensive angle, right? So this is going to be very long reach, but it has to be very high precision in alignment. That is going to be larger than 0 0.1 millirad. So the white beam, you can have any angle you want. So the question is, then should I pick an arrow beam, a white beam, or should I know what kind of angle do I need to pick? Now this is the model of the trend. Good thing about this, about using trends, I'm going to use this method so because it's a highly directional signal. Uh, is that uh, to this one as a geometrical. This is a view, a view from the top of the train. We see that the train is traveling here on the tracks to the source here. Why are we putting the source here? Because that's what it says in the literature, because everybody uses it. So we adopted that one. I want to show you later on that it's not that right. And then we see that there's some distance. So we're going to in between the point where we cover for the train, the train when it starts coming on this point to this point is actually covered. It has connectivity. We can be connected to the internet. When we get out of that coverage, we get disconnected. That's fine. And here we're going to have more power. As we reach to this side, we should get into contact with a new base station on the ground so we can continue to have connectivity. After the orientation of the transceiver, we're going to consider these two distances. Okay. And this is going to be the tilt angle, which is actually equivalent to the distance that we have here. But we have to consider how wide is the beam. Here is going to be the divergence angle. And here is divided by two because it's going to be the axis of the dispersion of the beam. So it's coming here. So the beam is actually illuminating some place in the air. The track into a powerful area of the beam. So something that we have to consider is that the receiver will have a sensitivity, and we need to know what is going to be that minimum sensitivity that we need to provide power so we're going to be able to communicate. And here I have a little uh, animation of how this is actually happening. As we see, the CMB continue providing coverage to the train. Very wide being wide because we're going to be losing power very fast. We're going to be moving into the coverage area, but then we're going to slow down in by making a beam wider. That's the nice thing that we want to do. If I make the beam too wide, I lose power. If I make the beam too narrow, why? Because I need to be shooting at it, practically, right? So what we found is this analysis on different direction signs. And we look into different parameters. For one thing that we wanted to do is to have a specific contact sign. That's going to be about one second. If you have one second connected to one base station, probably that's going to be a lot of time, right? And you try to do very fast handovers. When you, we're going to uh, be communicating with one base station to the next. The sensitivity of the receiver we adopted to be at 36 dBm, which is a very general receiver side at the photo uh, diodes that are going to be receiving the signal. You can find it in the market. That's a complex sign, and we see that, of course, as we increase the version angle, well, that one is going to be you know, increasing, right? And if we have an arrow beam, we can keep communicating with the train because the train getting a point from the base station, we can actually be communicated, but that's very ideal. <clears throat> also, that's going to be very good for the narrow beam, very bad for the wide beam because it's only going to be 100 meters. Then we have to do something. Well, this one, this information is not telling us anything else but to pick an arrow beam. Into the area of the receiver, we see that, that by increasing the area of the receiver, which is this area, right? This is in certain way 
the orientation of the beam, and that depends also on the divergence angle. This is going to be the power that we want to receive. This is the BM is going to be around here. So this is the zone that we want to actually communicate because here we just won't be able to do it. Is that, that you know some of the beams that are to this area is going to be anything that is going to be larger than 0.5 degrees. We are shooting now for a wide beam. Now, some of the major problems that we may face on um, high speed trains is that the fast in the mirror may not steer that fast after all. And by evaluating the different means, uh, the reading angle, we found that is, this is going to be the maximum speed of the fast in the mirror that we can actually find in the market. Beam is going to be losing that signal because it's moving too fast. You know, the, the narrow is the beam. The, fa the fastest we have to steer to follow to catch up with the speed of the train. So anything of the that is wider than that in the bridge design will that would be okay. So it seems like we cannot actually use a wide beam with this technology of fast steering mirrors. Somebody come up with a faster steering mirror, significantly faster steering mirrors will be able to do it. Uh, 18,000 degrees per second. So the second thing is we look at took a look into the and we see that if the beam is too narrow, obviously we're going to be scope of the transmission of the beam. So we want to use a wide beam for that case. So this is the again the uh, model of the trend. We have now something seen from the side instead of from the top view. Sorry. So here we have the track of the trend. Imagine that this block is actually the trend, not very dynamic, but just for uh, visual purposes, and here pointing to the train, right? We had the transceiver here going to the train. We're actually moving into the train direction that's going to be a longitudinal displacement. That's what is plain. When the train oscillates to the sides, maybe because we are passing by some kind of curve, that's going to be a set lateral displacement. And what we found is also, again, when we do the evaluations, uh, we consider a vibration of 80 hertz, about 60 millimeters. The beams are going to start losing power the narrow they are. So the very narrow beam is going to be losing the sensitivity of the, the receiver side. Connection, so we just cannot use it. <coughs> so <coughs> finally, <coughs> If we represent that one in this graph, we're going to see that uh, for uh, 36 uh, dBMs, the residue of the receiver, the narrow beam won't be able to do that connection because every time the, the train vibrates, you're going to be losing that signal. So for lateral vibrations, by lateral vibrations, there is not much we can do because the train is moving into a weird direction in reference to the transceiver. So what we can do then is to provide a safety margin on the coverage areas. So you remember this model about the coverage area where the, the track is actually illuminated by the laser? What we're trying to do is to make it smaller to be able to cover the train uh, during that vibration occurrence. So my, the conclusion, well, we have to use, it's possible, um, the version angle that is going to be about 10 millirads, and then millirads is going to give you half a degree. Right. The maximum range on what we can actually communicate is going to be about 700 meters, but that's going to be the maximum distance from the transceiver to the light, the fabric point to the train. So there is one part of that distance that is actually not covered, giving an effective coverage for 620 meters. Contact time is going to be 8.65 seconds, and that seems to be pretty good because we usually have uh, contact times on the order of one second. Now, the drawback of this work, as you see, I didn't speak about atmospheric conditions. Why? Because people have gotten away from FSO and actually using it because every time you have a foggy, that moment you start losing the signal. And that is the reason why it scares a lot of people in using life itself. So we're going to consider that in this next question. <clears throat> so the next following basic question was to say, where do we actually need to put the base stations? 
So we saw that we inherited a model because that's what it was in the literature. And that's what also makes us think that we have to challenge, you know, the status quo most of the time. Meaning whatever you know by tradition, right? here we have the trend. <clears throat> between the transition that we call the longitudinal distance, the distance between the train and the transceiver far away from the track, that's going to be called the lateral distance, right? Um, you have a coverage distance, you're going to have to have a new base station to be able to continually provide the signal to the train. So some of the challenges that we have here is that uh, fewer base stations, that what B stands for. That why is because it's going to give you low cost. Not only providing that's actually cheap, what is costly is to provide the maintenance. Then we have to develop what is going to be the coverage model because we see that also we have to question that. Should we use just the model that everybody been using? The previous cases we didn't find we didn't cover right now. Now, you don't lose the signal, right? You actually may not even notice that you're moving from one station to another. We haven't been addressing that into the literature yet, right? so, so we can to address it. What are we going to do? Where are we going to put the transceivers then on the ground? We have to find that. And that's going to be also determined by the handover time. How long does it take to make a handover? We don't have an FSO system on high speed trains, so we don't have experience on that. But there are some at literature and they are registering certain videos to make the transition handover, but there is no model on the handover, there is no model on the coverage. And it was to come with the coverage model. And the challenge was responded by this way. When we say, okay, if we're going to inherit that model that we saw before, this is the top view again, illuminating this part of the track, the train is going to be communicating when we go from CI to DI provide some handover mechanisms to make it seamless before the train gets out of that illuminated. So we're going to put another source light here. We're going to have some overlap here. Yeah. And then the train has to start communicating with these transceivers, the previous one, right? So uh, to be able to do that, we need to know how long is this distance from CI plus one to DI. Sometimes it takes to make it a handover. No. How much is the handover? Right? So we look into the literature and some models they have provided to be about one second. And to make it efficient, we say, well, if I want to have to waste one second doing the handover, to make it on um, communication with the station such that I won't be able to have an expensive system. I don't want to invest 50% of my time to only get 50% of communications. What I want to do, I want to get something better. So we're looking into that value to be a critical one. So that means that if I do that, I'm trying to, if I possible, I would try to say that the time in contact with the base station here, twice the time here. And that's going to give me the threshold to be able to pick what are going to be the different distances. One of the questions that we have from our sponsor is that, well, yeah, that's pretty nice, but what about fog? We everybody know that fog is going to interrupt the beam. It's actually modern for different type of visibility, like a discrete model. Which one of them are going to affect how much what parts of the beam out? And to then to look into the most foggy place, so the visibility is going to be probably half a kilometer. And then if we're using that kind of signal, we need to find out how much power we need to transmit the laser to be able to communicate to it, because that's the only way right now we know to communicate to fog, to increase the power, make it a narrow beam. Because where we need to put the transceiver, right? And the position of the transceiver, if you remember, actually given by the distance that we have, lateral distance here to the transceiver from the track, we start illuminating the track. So this is going to be the longitudinal distance, and that's going to be the lateral distance. One, we have now certain orientation of the transceiver, is that what is going to be the divergent sign? Position, 
is going to give me an optimal value. Optimize the lateral distance. I need to optimize the longitudinal distance minus the average time at the same time. It seems to be a very complex system. You know, position actually you can visualize this way. A different distance. I need to pick also probably a different divergence angle to be able to find out what is the the the, the maximum optimal coverage I can provide to this fast uh, frame. So with this one analysis for lateral distance and and these are different depression angles, and these are the results. What we saw is that when you have fog in uh, convecting uh, here, that is going to be always a max over the minus, minus uh, uh, 36 dBm. Certain distances are not going to be feasible because they want to get this connection. And certain distances, especially when you get close, this is when you're going to have being what is we did for the evaluation and what we saw here also is in the model that we have uh numbers. that means that for this model we will need to have one wavelength here another wavelength here basically is pointing to this direction backwards to see two transceivers and we need to pick one of the transceivers but the two, two transceivers have the same color so we're trying to use different wavelengths. That means the transition is going to be a little bit complex to do that. And I will be able to detect when I get into a different coverage area by new wavelength at that point. <clears throat> when we did the analysis and longitudinal distance of receiving power, to be the bigger So, because that's a speed of the receiver, some modulation technique that is going to be very simple, just on off key. The more complicated, you're going to get better results. For clear weather and heavy fog. And you see in clear weather, things going, going up. So, this is very easy to pick. You have to pick something around here. Okay? In heavy fog, you're going to have also some mean maximum point. Which is pretty good for us because that simplifies the work. And some of the maximum distance is going to be at this point, which is going to be at about 500 meters. From the turn and distance, in addition to that, you want to have also that. And we will increase the coverage because we are not happy with this 500 meters of coverage, right? Come and say, LT can give you. We shouldn't compare with LT because it's not comparing apples to apples. Provide a high data rate and LT. We use uh, uh, the, uh, the previous model. The transceiver is going to be complex, and we have a limit on 500 meters. That's something else. And then we were thinking, well, if I have a little more, uh, and have a coverage area, have overlaps. So that means I'm going to have a area here. Well, black out, you want to call it that. To avoid being disconnected, and something that we already take as high students on top of the train. The receiver is going to communicate with the new target area, but this back transceiver is going to communicate with the previous base station. I don't see a disconnection. But then if I do that, I will be able to separate the transceiver the part and most I can the train, and then I want to separate that same distance, and then I don't have an overlap. So how do I start the trunk the handover now? Remember, in the previous case, I do start the trunk the handover. In this case, is when I don't see anything. The signal, they say, okay, get ready. Something is coming up. Right? So the phone transceiver can start at the handover when it was to this one. We're going to enhance the coverage area up to this point. So we can have the dark area. And that depends on the design of the train. Depends on how much you can separate from series. This uh, analysis that we did for, for this single wavelength 
that overlaps, we can have only one single wavelength. The coverage to up to 100 times. Because usually high speed trains are not very long, at least the cars are not very long. And which is a thing, and probably the most important part of the study is that if you see this graph, it's like this is the decent like after two meters, we have this kind of power in the, uh, of the coverage 25 centimeters, turn it the maximum. And then I asked the students, well, why just 25 centimeters? Why don't you go even closer to it? At that time, we were worried about the trains going to hit it, right? But well, it doesn't matter, right? You can put it on top of the train. This is study, it's telling you the model is wrong. The trans right? has closer, you know, okay? <clears throat> The words that we're trying to do is how we do increase the coverage. And that was in another work that we did on our students. Actually, it was happening almost at the same time. Break with those habits from the traditional models. We want to do that, and then we go widen the beam, and you see at the base stage, how much you not do that. So the train can communicate from five distance away. What we want to do then a transceiver on the train. Mm -hmm. then, well, it seems like we all the time, but we didn't really address it. So, so that opens the, the, the space for doing addition, additional design. It's very simple. <coughs> a station that has some transceiver that is going to be rotating. Right, that transceivers look back. We're gonna rotate a wider angle, so we probably have to have a gimbal. So that uh, we're gonna have also a gimbal on the train that is these as we keep moving to the handle. But remember, these guys making connection, especially we're gonna be connection forward to the train when it's in front of the train, and we're gonna keep it even when the train passes by the base station, so it's going to be looking backwards. So the train start making a connection, first when the station is in front of the train, when the base station is now behind the train. So it has to move a very wide angle, that's right. And the handover. So the, the handover is still having a Transceiver on the top of the train, but we're going to have a fixed transceiver. So that fixed transceiver is a yellow color, and uh, the connection with the target PS in the communication. One is a disk guys is still connected to the end to the phone. We're going to increase the distance between the two different base stations. Reduce the number of base stations in it. We train is very successful, especially when you have to travel very long distances. And, uh, there are some tracks that are go for many hundred, maybe thousand miles, right, on the train. There are some parts where the train lives, where nobody wants to live there. Send somebody to do get maintenance there, right? So we want to reduce the number of base stations that have to be serviced. We do that and we compare with something that has this fixed orientation of the transceivers on the train. And we're going to have about 60% reduction in the number of transceivers, which is. And we also have some connectivity analysis on how much uh, in DBM. This is probably what is the distance between different. And we also do a comparison with the FITS scheme. That's going to be the rotating scheme, it's called rate. What happened to the how many bits per second we can, uh, when we are driving? And we see that, yeah, it's going to be some variations depending on how you get 
get far away from the, I'm sorry from the from the base station. Much less than having the a fixed transition advantage and it increases by probably by twenty percent or so. This is some of the work that we have done so far. It is uh, there are so many different problems. For instance, I talk about it mostly with Tari Hassan and Mosakhneli. Larger than anything else, it has also just by using a mirror. Is that these trends because go very fast, they create some turbulence, silver selected the transceivers to preferably on the back of the train, so the transceiver backwards instead of looking forward. And from metals that you can see. Um, the turbulence to the flow is as large as we have to that to, to try to make the system closer to a reality one. Uh, we, do we have time tomorrow? Do we have time or to be cut here? Mm -hmm. We have, okay, you have to try not to get you down to sleep so fast for the woke up. So, uh, <clears throat> is that, uh, like I said before, the two components reserved for power grid is one, any of the high speed power, electrical power to be able to move. That was quite a minute on that part too. So, we call this one the control delivery. If we, why? Because you're challenging something that works so far. It's something that has worked for many hundred years. We already, many people know a lot about it. So, so providing that we can actually do it in some way, sometimes could be a little bit dangerous. So we look, uh, look into the properties of the power grid, some approach that is called the smart grid, but the smart grid tends to be only smart meters to provide some information to the providers to see what's actually happening. Only to do modifications on the distribution of power in the grid. Do something that doesn't is not reactive. Something is proactive. That's a for actually happening. And some of the motivation for this is that a black. Coming to somebody who is not actually affected on the area affected by the blackout, or at least to avoid cascading blackouts. So, what we notice on the current power grid is that we have always energy in it. So, whenever you want to connect to the power grid, it's just very easy. You just go and plug yourself on it. In the step, and you charge your phone, you plug that you find on the wall, and you buy it for permission, right? Even though that's an energy that seems to have paid, not us, right? Want to charge here, right? And <clears throat> right? But this is it's not much money, probably nobody worried yet about it. And the grid doing that, we have to expect always to be balanced by demand and supply. That is going to be totally balanced, otherwise, it's going to create a lot of problems on it. Also, little cooperation between energy sources, for instance, now that we have electric vehicles. Uh, uh, so, uh, solar panels and so on, you have know, energy sources. You want to connect it to the grid, we still don't know how to do it because the grid was not actually made for that. If you, connect, if you connect to the grid, but the grid has enough power, there is no need to do it, right? If your solar cell is not really working 100% or probably it's not running out of energy, you energy from the grid and so on. And also people are concerned that if it has too many alternative energy sources and you want it to the grid, that's going to create an imbalance on the grid, that is going to create some problems in the face of the grid. So all these different characteristics make us think, well, I have always energized the grid. Second thing, I never tell anybody not to connect. A cable I want to wear a short circuit, it's just very easy. Just come to the plug and do the short circuit. 
when a plane down that part of the, part of the, of the network. Instead of doing that, what if we have, uh, adjust or uh, adopt some of the principles that we use on the internet? The internet seems to provide many different advantages, and one of the advantages is because you actually packetize data. You're going to start to use a request and grant process. Imagine that you're going to connect your cell phone now, and that cell phone is going to have your identity, and that identity is going to say, okay, I need energy for my cell phone. So I'm going to send a request to the service provider before the energy actually comes to the plug. I'm going to grant it. I just something. Maybe this is a. Once I get my request on the say, okay, it sends a grant, it sends the energy to the phone. Was actually taking that energy. It's very attractive because it's not free to us, right? Increase the cost of generating power, uh, generating power, then we probably can decrease cost of distribution of energy. That's a lot of coal, that is what is the main source of. Yes, it's uncontaminated. We're going to have an address. We have an address that you actually, an address probably belongs to you as a person. We know that now if we have some kind of energy that Instead of bringing the whole network energy for everybody, so no, we just provide to some users, probably those who are critical, like hospitals and so on, with energy. So, just to give you a very quick idea, what we're trying to do is this if you see the equivalent uh, impression of what is the current power grid, it's going to look like this. A lot of electrical systems are working real time, transmission borders, and distributing energy. And what we're trying to do is something like Reach here, feeding different loads, getting energy from different sources, and being controlled by the PNN. So, things like the internet, right? So, we're going to have different nodes, so we have to be able to allocate those kind of controls to different parts of the network that go according to the G in the present grid by designing many different type of systems work to be able to take all the different advantages that we probably can obtain. It's going to be into avoiding blackouts. So let's you some of the uh, experiments that we have done. So we did something very simple. We asked some students to build here to having the network control the delivery of energy. And when we ask the students, okay, we actually we want to if, and we actually want to packet as energy. The same the idea of packet as energy is say, well. It's crazy. You need to close the circuit, the loop, and to be able to distribute energy. And we say, well, okay, let's take it step by step. So, so what we're going to do is just to control the delivery by using the network. We know that being granted or not. So what we come with the idea is say, well, you see. Actually, um, then we have here some access points that is going to be similar in that you need to have in the appliances that want to see the requests and grants. So that's going to be communicating with the data network. The data network is provided by this internet switch, a server that is connected into how much energy we want to distribute. Here are three users. Every user has two live ones. One of them is going to be 60 watts, the other one is going to be 40 watts, so we have 100 watts. We want to provide 300 watts because then it's exactly the same as the previous grid, right? What happens if I have only 100 watts to provide? This guy, the control is my cool one. That's going, that's going to say, okay, who? Uh, anyone to have 100 watts to provide. So the same thing can happen if we have a bad device. A bad device, let's say, 
it's actually requesting a lot of energy because the access point will test in that part. And we see that the power is very large compared to the capacity of the room. Then in that case, the provider says, well, you, because you request it too much, I'm not going to give you anything to use. Right? And then what we see when we do something like that, we evaluate it, uh, how much of the satisfaction of the request, because that's going to be the, the, the big question, right? If you have a limited amount of power, get all the time you want, I didn't And we see that this is the satisfaction ratio to be the number of requests and, uh, uh, and the number of demands that ratio between those two to keep increasing less power. But as you see, we're not exactly addressing 300 watts. We're addressing much less than that. So another point is that well, I don't have to deliver this energy in real time. So what if I deliver it intermittently? It's called a different time. Have some kind of energy storage. And uh, to be able to monitor energy storage, we use some laptops. So it's actually the system that we're using of today's energy storage, right? Even though we don't really put too much energy into it. The, the battery equipment, when the laptop has enough energy in the battery, then it start, the, the laptop doesn't need to take it from the power grid. So that would be a, a way to maximize the use of the battery in this system also to provide that uh, can be done. Too. The only problem we saw is that the batteries take too long, long time to actually so they be connected for a long time. So limiting explode this morning. So what we're trying to do our experiments are driving us to for the software because remember there are the number of communications with the network. In the uh, consider what I want to do the status, many on the status, status series of the generators, you can decide what to do and how to do it. So I think I think it must be have. I hope that you know uh, you can follow me to this very long presentation. Hi Roberto, I am Richard Matthew from the Universidad Tecnológica de la Mitec. Spanish is okay too. I am wondering about, uh, well, the first part of the the part 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 your talk. There is some kind of, um, well, you were talking about losses. Right. Transmission losses. Kind of uh, transmission control process. In this kind of uh, optical. Well, uh, that, that, that's a good point. Uh, this, this is a layer system, right? Uh, if, we, if we look at the layer system, we, have, we can look into the open system interconnection. And there's going to be many layers. So, also to the data link layer. Remember, we're going to have physical layer, data link layer. layer, layer. Have some other more layers than what you want to define. For example, protocol that you're talking about is actually happening, like, you know, that transport layer, but we're going to have some recovery of errors. But the losses are going to be very important. The losses on data, please, per se. Well, they're going to reflect the losses of data. Wow, one degree is over. It'll be great. But the first layer, the main layer, may check the, the, the header. The full error correction mode, right? the data link layer, and that we throw away the frame if something wrong. Yes, in the upper layer. Have you explored uh, applications on the VC or HVC on the world? No, so far we haven't been looking into underwater, but I can tell you that there is underwater styles. And that's a very interesting word because sometimes people don't want to use if they saw on the word, the, the, the medium is thicker. The distance may not be as long. 
But yeah, you can, right now we are focusing with friends. Uh, we're hoping that we can find another interesting application because when you start looking into the so FSO, great potential on doing many different things. But yeah, that would be one possibility for the future. Yes. Um, is there a, an alternative solution to this data of Pixel besides, um, for example, I mean, uh, the next generation of mobile systems? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's going to use frequencies. I mean, yeah. So that's going to be one thing. People don't know exactly what kind of technology they want to use. So uh, there is a chance that 5G may be a possible solution also for higher speakers. But we see we need to see a little bit more before that happens. In the future, we're not gonna see only one dominant technology on it. We're gonna see multiple technologies. On today's cell phones, it's LTE. Plus the old Wi-Fi that we have always had there to make it. So we probably gonna see something like that. Five G is definitely one computing technology <laughs> for every sign in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.